my name is Steve DeVeza. I'm at, from the University of Manchester. Uh, I'm a political theorist working in the politics department. My research covers two main areas. One is the intersection between ethical conduct and political efficiency, or the interface between politics and ethics, if you like. And the other area is on a secular account of evil. The question of can you define and understand the notion of evil, which isn't tied to some kind of religious concept or religious metaphysics. And so you've worked on the problem of dirty hands in uh, politics. Could you set out where you stand on this? So in, in the literature, the problem of dirty hands is a problem that goes back quite a way, but it, it was revived in the early 70s by a man called Michael Walser who wrote a, a fantastic article called uh, Political Action, The Problem of Dirty Hands. And since then, there's been this resurgence of, of research that's been on the problem of dirty hands. The problem of dirty hands is effectively the question of what is it possible for you to do wrong in order to do right? Can you act in a way that is immoral for the right kinds of reasons? Right? In other words, can you, can you be justifiably uh, act in ways that are immoral? And many people think it's impossible. They think it's a, a contradiction. It's, it's not only a contradiction, it's problematic because it leads you down a slippery slope of immorality. But there's a huge number of examples of uh, in real life and film and literature which suggest that our moral reality is much more messy than, than moral theories would allow us to have. And what Dirty Hands tries to do is to, to open up a, a, a gray space where you can, in certain circumstances, cases of moral conflicts, cases of moral dilemmas, where you can find a place where you had to act in a way that broke a, a very cherished moral value to bring about some kind of lesser evil or to bring about some kind of noble end. And so would you be able to give an example of either from a film or from real life, which shows that okay, so, it's not as uh, simple as moral theory, maybe. Okay, so um, let, let's do something really contemporary, uh, which would be Game of Thrones. So Game of Thrones is, is a typical TV show, but it, one of its premises is that what do good people do? One of its premises asks the question, what do good people do in the face of evil? And without giving any spoilers away about what's happening in Game of Thrones, uh, there are certain characters there that are good, uh, trying to do good, but they face very evil opponents, which forces them to do things which are bad. And as a result, the consequences of that means something happens to them for acting badly when they didn't want to do that. And the repercussions of not acting badly when they had to for dirty hands reasons means lots more people suffer than otherwise would have suffered. So that's a kind of example of what's going on. Uh, in real life, there, you know, uh, there are examples, but another very famous one is the, the ticking bomb scenario, which is often quoted in dirty hand scenarios, where a person has planted a bomb in a major city, say London, uh, they're boasting it's going to kill hundreds of people, maybe thousands, you've caught the person, they won't tell you where the whereabouts of the bomb are, you can't get the people out, you know, all that kind of things, and it's going to go off in the next 24 hours. What do you do? Well. If you're a politician, the prime minister trying to protect people in the country or in that city, you're going to have to try and prevent that bomb from going off because hundreds will die. The person won't tell you what, where the bomb is, so would you be able to torture them? Now, we know torture is wrong. No civilized state engages in torture. It's a, a horrible moral crime. On the other hand, you're in a situation where if you don't do it, many hundreds of people might die. So many people think that's a classic example of how dirty hands arises. A politician who's a good person is trying desperately not to do anything wrong, is forced to commit torture to try and bring about a situation where hundreds of people don't get killed. Now, it's very complicated. It's not quite like that because, of course, you could end up torturing and still not finding the bomb, and then you've done a terrible thing without any good results. But nevertheless, that, that, that's the kind of structure of the problem. A moral dilemma or a moral conflict which you have to act to bring about a lesser evil, and in doing that, you've committed some kind of moral violation. And so in that situation, is the, say, the decision to torture, is that an uh, immoral decision or a moral yes. decision? Yes. That's, that, that, that's what distinguishes it from other kinds of moral theories. Dirty hands is, is, is unique in the sense that it says you did wrong and right at the same time. You were wrong to torture, but you were right to try and stop those people from getting killed. And so you're morally guilty of a crime and you've got moral pollution, but at the same time, a reasonable person in your position would have done the same thing. So the question is, should we punish them? If so, how? 
Uh, question is, you know, is this something that morally pollutes them forever? Uh, do we want our politicians to be like that? Um, do we want politicians not to be like that? Michael Walser talks about politicians as being the kind of politicians we need are those who are good, but not too good. What does he mean by that? He means they're good enough so we, they don't become corrupt and nasty and vicious and all the rest of it. On the other hand, they will do those kinds of things to protect us when it's absolutely necessary that they do that. And why do you stand on this? So I'm, I'm, I'm very much a dirty hands theorist. That's, that's where I, I work in the area. And my, my work, the book that I'm writing at the moment, is all about trying to find a philosophical space where you can say how that theory operates uh, in relation to its rivals, such as consequentialism or deontology and so on. So, and, then, and then looks at the various consequences of having dirty hands. What kind of emotions did you feel? Whether you should punish them or not? How does it apply in a democratic society? Does it apply in cases of war? Um, yeah, and, and so on and so forth. Are there red lines that can't be crossed? Or? Yes. And again, that, that's, that's part of the theory. That, that's part of putting out the criteria for what it is about dirty hands. I mean, some, some of these criteria are, are similar to just war theory criteria, things like proportionality, things about ensuring that uh, there's a, a reasonable chance that you would actually bring about the lesser consequence, those kinds of things. But those are all part of the, the intricate part of, of a worked out theory of dirty hands. Uh, and talking about um, the sort of leaders that we want, uh, whether we want leaders that are good but not too good, for instance, if we're accepting that uh, politics is dirty in this way, or politicians have to be, does that change what it is to be a citizen in accepting this? Well, two, two points, two, two, two things to say to that. The first is that it's not just politicians that get dirty hands. We all can get dirty hands. Um, it's true that in politics it's more vivid and it's more common because of the nature of politics where you're dealing with power and you're dealing with the allocation of resources and you have to protect people and you've got special roles. So that's true. In, in politics we find dirty hand scenarios much more commonly than in everyday life. But anybody can face a, a moral conflict or dilemma in any situation where you have to make choices between bad and worse, and in so doing your means of, of bringing about the lesser evil are, are morally problematic. So that's the first point. Um, the, the second point about citizens, well, it, I just recently wrote a paper uh, which was about democratic dirty hands. Uh, do we as Democrats get dirty hands if our politicians get dirty hands on our behalf? Because remember, politicians get dirty hands to protect us. They act in our name. They're doing it to ensure that we are the people that benefit from their actions, even if it costs them moral purity or it, it puts their souls in jeopardy to make it rather graphic, right? I'm not quite as graphic as that all the time. Um, do we not share some of that moral dirt if politicians get dirty hands on our behalf? And that's a very complicated story about how complicit we are in what our politicians do. Uh, but certainly as Democrats, if we believe that we give the power to our politicians to act on our behalf, if they're getting dirty hands, there is some kind of rollback onto us. But very complicated story to be told. Right. And does agency play a part there in how much people feel like they are part of the decisions being made? Absolutely. So if, if, if you happen to be a, a North Korean, uh, whatever the North Korean dictator does has very little relevance to your complicity in this because you had no say in his being there or doing what you do. But for us, because we have the agency of electing our leaders, some of what they do falls back on us. If we elect rogues and nasty people and they act on our behalf, well, we're partly responsible. Not entirely, but partly responsible. So yes, agency is, is, is an important part of this. And we bear in mind that we elect politicians, certainly in this country, who are our representatives. They're not our delegates. So there is an a, 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 a obligation for them to use their own reason and judgment and morality to act on our behalf. I mean, delegates would just do what we tell them to do. They're not delegates in that sense, right? And given that, there is a gap between what they do and our responsibility for what they do because they can choose in terms of their own uh, consciousness and so on. But nevertheless, we put them there and we gave them the power. And uh, so some of it rolls back onto us. How much exactly? Very complicated story. And moving on to your work on evil, where has that taken you? Where have you focused your research on? Right, so, so my interest in evil arose in part because of my interest in dirty hands, because one of the scenarios of dirty hands is how do you deal with people who are evil or evil actions of others? So I thought to myself, well, what do we mean by evil? It seems to be a term that uh, many people have disregarded as being based in some religious 
background or metaphysics that's been completely discredited. So what could we possibly mean by evil? And um, there are certainly certain kinds of actions which we don't think are just very wrong. We think there's something qualitatively different about those acts. And we, we call them evil. So I ended up working in an area on secular accounts of evil. And I, I, my first paper that I wrote on this was all about uh, thinking about evil from a dirty hands perspective. Uh, and then I just got into the, 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 the discussion with other people who are working in this area, which are quite a large number. Just finished an edited book on, on, on uh, Routledge, uh, Routledge handbook on the philosophy of evil. And um, there you have all these people coming in with different definitions of secular, different problems that arise in the secular account of evil and so on. Uh, and that was one of the panels that I did, was to talk about uh, evil um, at, at, at this uh, Let the Light Festival. Do you see evil as something separate that's out there, or it's something within humans that's sort of? Well, I, I, I don't I don't really think of evil in terms of looking for an essence. Um, uh, that tends to be a kind of legacy from the the, the religious uh, views. You know, it's somehow either a, something inside us or it's a demon. Uh, I, I, my particular work looks at what what do we mean by evil actions? Uh, now, it's true that you can have evil persons who don't commit evil actions, and you can have evil actions committed by people who are not evil. They just do an evil thing. And so my focus has been largely on the evil actions. Uh, some of my colleagues have been working on evil persons. I'm very much more reluctant to go that way because I, I think that evil persons, genuine evil persons are very rare, and I'm not entirely sure whether, even if they are evil, they're responsible for what they're doing because many evil persons are, you know, seem to be psychopathic in some sense. So the question is whether they actually have agency to, to, to understand what they're doing that's wrong. So my work is focused mostly on, on, on the problem of evil action. Um, but that said, I, I, I have tried to develop a concept of evil, which I think is different from the different conceptions of evil. Conceptions are the different ways in which you understand the concept. Um, so you can have a concept of justice, which is treat people fairly, but you can have different conceptions about how you treat people fairly. You can have a conservative one, a liberal one, and so on. So the same thing with evil. You can have a concept of evil about what evil is, in some sense, and the different ways in which you think that that plays out. And I think that the concept of evil arises because we live in a society where we rely on interactions with other human beings for our well-being, all of us. We can't live the lives we live unless we have this kind of multiple complex interaction. And that is held together in part by morality, in part by law, in part by force. And evil is when the morality of those interactions gets subverted or inverted. People who are evil seek to destroy, the, if you like, the moral uh, landscape in which we live. They try to obliterate it or to invert it or to, um, to warp it in some sense. And um, I think we all understand what evil is in the sense that it's those people who are going to do things which are going to make any kind of tolerable life we have impossible. Because if you are starved or tortured or murdered or left homeless or et cetera, you know, all those kinds of things, whatever your view of the good life is, whatever it is, you're not going to be able to live that good life because of those things being done to you by virtue of the fact of the kind of being you are, a being that needs to be fed and watered and loved and housed and all the rest of it. So evil is when person's act in a way to, to undermine those very fundamental things so that you cannot lead a good life. And that means the conceptions are different because some people will see that in religious terms, some people will see it in secular terms, some people will see it in terms of the consequences of your actions, some people will see it in terms of the mo motivations, and some will see it in the combination of all those kind of things. But essentially the concept is all underlying that is the worry about the fact that you're going to be impacted in a way that means you can't live your life in any decent or reasonable way because of somebody else's actions or or views or whatever. And then, so how does an act come to be named evil then, if there's all these right. different definitions of So evil? It's, it's a very complicated story. So some people will argue, uh, in fact, most evil theorists will say it's got to do with the kind of harms you cause. So catastrophic harms or life-changing harms or, or, or something of that. Acts that cause that are evil acts. Some people will say, and I'm one of those, will say, uh, it also can be the kind of intentions you have, the kinds of motives you have, certain kind of cruelty, a certain kind of humiliation of others. Those also can contribute to what it is to be evil. And some people, 
I'm also one of those that think that is actually a combination of the two that bring about what an evil act is. So you don't require any kind of metaphysical notion. You can look at it in terms of a person's motives and intentions and the consequences of the act to see which kind of acts are qualitatively different from mere wrongdoing. And are there acts throughout history that might have been named evil that you... Oh, how long have you got? Words. <laughs> Uh, look, evil acts go on all the time, right? And, uh, you know, we, we see it reach a crescendo when you have a Nazi ideology in the background or when you see Stalin's, you know, uh, Marxism or when you see Mao in operation or the Khmer Rouge or the massacres in, in um, Rwanda or what went on in Bosnia. I can go on. I mean, we could be here for another week. And I can, most of our history is filled with cases of, of evil actions towards other people. Uh, in fact, in the, in the late, you know, we we are actually a lot better off now than we probably were hundreds and thousands of years ago. I mean, the routine cruelty that used to take place thousands of years or even hundreds of years ago would absolutely astound us today. The way people were treated. So we, we're making some kind of progress, but we still. I mean, that, that's a, that's a whole issue that about where we are morally mor mor and so on. But but evil acts abound. They're all over the place. And of course, there's Hannah Arendt has talked about evil that's banal. You can have the banality of evil, where people commit evil acts, even though they're not doing anything that looks evil. You know, you're working in an office where you rake out lists for people being transported to gas chambers. You call that the banality of evil. Heinrich was organizing the removal of Jews to concentration camps. He wasn't actually killing them himself, but he was making it possible for millions to die. Banality of evil. He actually even thought he wasn't doing something evil. Well, well that's his claim anyway. I don't think that's true, but that's what he claimed. So that's the banality of evil. So evil, evil is, is, is very common. Evil acts. Whether they're genuinely evil persons, that's a whole different dis discussion to be had again. Because there you're talking about something about a personality, a predisposition to act that way, a certain kind of gloating uh, uh, pleasure from the, the suffering of others. I'm sure there are people like that, but it's much harder to know whether these people are psychopathic or whether they actually are in their right minds or what, you know. So I, I, I tend to shy away from that kind of discussion. But is there a way we can truly name such acts as evil if, if we recognize that there's all these different definitions of evil? Well, it's, it's, um, it's, it's like saying that something is wrong and recognizing the different moral theories, right? So we all think that murder is wrong, but why we think it's wrong will depend on the different moral theory that you use. So if you are a consequentialist, you'll think it's wrong because of the consequences of killing somebody. If you are a deontologist, it's wrong because you've broken the categorical imperative. If you're a virtue ethicist, and so it goes on, right? So we're not disputing about the fact that there's wrong actions. We're disputing the, why we think they're wrong. And the same goes with, with evil. I mean, most people wouldn't dispute that torture and, and rape and genocide are, are evil acts. They just have different reasons to think why it is evil acts. And where would you like this research to take you next? Oh, <laughs> I'm going to stop doing evil soon, I think. It's a very depressing topic to me too. Yeah, on. is this about the yeah. personal impact of yeah. having to study? Well, such I mean, art? you read you read terrible things about human beings all the time. So um, I don't know where it's going to go. I mean, I, I have one. I have a. I have a my own particular theory of of evil, which uh, has been called uh, by others, not by me, a, a disjunctive pluralist theory of evil. And I, I well, it's 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 a account of what evil actions are, but it's disjunctive because there are three criteria, and it's pluralist because it doesn't have one catch-all idea of what an evil act is. And I think that I can probably get a short book out of that explaining what it is and how it interacts with other views. And the, so I might, might have that as a future project once I've finished my book on Dirty Hands. I might, depends. I might just be too exhausted and just give up altogether. Is there any examples of sort of political act that's been seen as uh, dirty that you would say is actually a case where it could have been a politician doing a morally right decision? Yeah, um, uh, I mean, one, one of the classics of a, a Dirty Hands Act uh, is of a man called Sir Stafford Cripps, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1950, I think it was 50, 48 to 50. Um, and he stood up in front of Parliament and he said that, uh, he lied to Parliament, saying that he, there was no plans to take the, the pound off the gold standard because there was economic problems. He was going to remove the pound from the gold standard to let it float. And he stood up in front of Parliament and lied. And he lied because he knew that if he didn't lie, um, spec speculators would then start selling the pound or whatever the case may be and destroy the economic policy he was involved. He couldn't even stand up and say, look, I'm not prepared to answer this question because that would have been taken as an acknowledgement that this was going to happen. So he had to stand up there and say, I'm an honest person because he was considered to be 
uh, upright and honest person. Trust me on this, not in the works. But of course, he knew perfectly well it was in the works. And many people think at his role as chancellor, protecting the economy, making sure that spec speculators didn't, you know, gain from the British economy unfairly and so on, he had to lie to Parliament. Now, lying to Parliament is a problem in a democracy because you can't, you can't do that and hope to have a system that's transparent and for people to be able to question you and understand your policies and so on. Nevertheless, most people think he did the right thing there, even though he lied. Right? And that's a case of lying for the right kinds of reasons. Now, the question, of course, is what do you think of Cripps? I mean, should he now be understood to be a liar and pay some price for that? Or should you just say, well, that's the job, you did nothing wrong. And that's the fight with dirty hands, that's the, that's the issue. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.